my old man used to have a saying that fashionably, if you keep a pair of trousers long enough, they will ultimately come back in fashion. You've just summed up show business. If you, I was going to say, if you go back and listen to the album, which I did no more than about two nights ago, no more interviewing you, it sounds like it could have come out about two years ago. It sounds like someone like Keen could have put it out, or someone like that. Well, the uh, Groove of Artists took a track from it a couple of years, three years ago, and I went and did a video with them with Bob, and it was April, Spring, Summer and Wednesdays. Yeah, we thought that was deep. What? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds good. And um, again, but you have to remember, so people were smoking then, so therefore, and audiences were much, and I heard this somewhere the other night, audiences began to get, you know, so they, they would hit you in the face when, when you opened up, as opposed to seeing them down where he is, sat on the floor looking at me like that. <laughs> so you got to try and get him, you see, whereas down there was okay. Well, once he gave up the drugs and went to the drugs... Dun, 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 was no good anyway. Dun, 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 dun. So all that was part of the... What was the question? Just about the album actually still sounding very, very Yeah, and I think uh, we would... We, at that point, had gone against all recording technique, which there wasn't much. And I'm not sure if we were on still four to fours then. In other words, you know what a four, a four to four? There would be four channels on a machine. So you'd record on three channels mixed down to one, and that just kept. That's how you made mono records. You could do that over and over again, and you. But the thing that was really good about them, then you would have to figure out, whilst you're putting down the bass, say Matchstick Men. Was the drums, all of the drums, and the bass guitar, and a first pass of organ, and first pass of guitar. So you did. A, they had to do a balance, and you had to be sure where the snare drum, bass drum, and bass guitar were going to be in the final mix, which could be, God knows what you're going to put on. So you did that, it goes to one track, you put on another four, it goes to one, and you kept doing this. Now, but it sounds to me like Mark Kelly might have been done on an eight track, because there's, and we were doing something here recently about Michael Jackson and that somebody's working on, and the early Beatles stuff is that, well, all the Beatles stuff's across eight tracks. So that the good thing about that then is you would look for a noise, what should we do, what can, and you sort of, that sounds good. Put try that. Put a mic there. Whereas now I can look through umpteen things and I'll find some noise, millions of them. And uh, what's the question again? <laughs> Just about the freshness of that album. Which yeah, think. and uh, we were, as I said, blanking all forms of recording technique. And we also brought in an, an, an idea we nicked off Lennon. I think you'd sing down a regular, uh, rather than these quality, you know, uh, studio mics. You'd have a little sure. And bring it. We had a WEM PA system at the time, which was really fucking running. And you put that in the in the studio, and that would be you'd be singing the lead vocal through one of those and micing it with a Neumann. Those kind of things happened, and there was no double tracking. And um, and I think it must have been that it was done on eight track on one inch. So again, a signal to noise ratios. All those things are much better. The bandwidth was greater, so it did sound a little bit. Other than that, it was probably a lot of smoking. <laughs> Blows it. Oh, it's probably drugs. Um, there are moments on that album that I think are tremendous. I th is Mark Kelly got um, Lazy Poker Blues on it? Yeah. Well, we were so taken with Chicken Shack when Fleetwood met. Oh, we met um, Chicken Shack one day. We were supporting at uh, some uni somewhere. Rick will remember this. We cut it. We were so taken with Christine Perfect. She even had the name Perfect. She played, you know, girls that played. Wow, that's only. And uh, and she could sing and write. And we just thought she was donkey's knob, you know. And uh, that's the bloke sing good. And um, she walked in and we both went Christine Perfect. She went, fucking puffs, fucking puffs, fucking puffs. And we went like, oh. been frightened of her ever since. But I always loved her to death. Um, what was the question where we were at today? Well, well, we're at. What I was going to come in with is, and then we have, of course, Down the Dust Pipe, the next big single. That came out of Ronnie Scott's office, a guy called Carl Grossman, kosher cowboy in a town like New Orleans. And he'd just given this song and we tried it out and just thought it was going to be bang off. It's funny because this guy, Tony Prince. Was it Tony Prince? Tony At Pie, or was he? There was the two, there was Prince. Peter Prince. Tony Prince was the DJ, was he not? And Peter Prince. Peter Prince was an MD at um, Phone, uh, Pi at the time. And he loved Down the Dust Pipe. It was released. And this is again shows at the time. It became a hit six months later. In that period of time, it was still getting played every day. La, la, la. 
la, la, la. he said, no, I still believe. And they just stayed with it. La, la, la. And eventually it was a hit. And that um, we did <laughs> we did Golden Shot and all sorts of things on that. People's idea was sat on a bloody JCB singing down the dust pipe. What the fuck's he got to do with a JCB? Anybody? Who cares? Which makes me laugh about Pile Driver. It's called Pile Driver. The Australians call it Pile River. And on the front, of, it's called Pile Driver. On the back, it's a gorilla with a bomb. Get it? No, nor do I. But at the time, we all went, yes! Bomb, gorilla, pile driver. What? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs>